good afternoon friends and uh, good afternoon to very good afternoon to organizers distinguished panel today with us when you are moderating a session the biggest problem the moderator has which approach to follow so that you connect with your audience most effectively and they gain out of the session you will be here for an hour and we'll be talking on various topics as i understand most of you are independent producers creative people and the panel that we have has got huge experience diverse experience india uk germany we have our respected deputy secretary with us you can hear the government response on that so i have personally decided that let this this be a open school session kind of panel right so we will talk we will try to cover all of your pain points instead of talking in air about you know this content how is it crossing overseas the trade issues we are not going to do that we are going to discuss exactly where your pain points are so panelists had been very kind to sit with me since yesterday and we have discussed most of the issues in length and you will have full freedom to ask questions we'll make it very interactive at the end of the session at least i'm trying to keep at least 5 minutes minimum to ask questions and 5 minutes i have allocated friends many of you may not be know the extreme right person sitting with us mr pame is known as a miracle man in the country <laughs> so last few minutes we will request mr pame to share his experience what inspired him to do that grassroots work and that goes as a message that is the most creative thing that he did in public policy space and uh, so so that's going to be the overall uh, architecture of the show and before i begin asking questions my perspective on the sector all reports almost all the reports you talk about fiki cii or many reports pwc global authors india today is around 55 billion dollar of the industry when i say india means media entertainment sector that includes all and the father of avgc industry is sitting in the first row and i have known him since last 20 years yeah if you can stand and all of you can clap for him <laughs> my connect with him is very old when i was in nascom driving it sector we drove that from 2 billion to 150 billion dollar today he is one of the prime movers he came and told us that avgc sector avgc that what you term today is avgc those days we used to call it animation sector so in nascom he came and told us that 14 billion dollar is the figure where sector can grow we all took his words and put all the efforts and today you see you are talking about global market i think 40 billion dollar and 5 6% we have already capitalized on that so 55 billion dollar is the size of the mne sector if you look at the global global market friends 270 billion dollar is the global size of film and video on demand only and if you look at your country india i think around 9 to 10 billion dollar so imagine 10 billion dollar divided by 270 into 100 is your percentage so lot of work has to be done second thing i interacted with couple of senior producers and film uh, industry person trillion dollar opportunity is going to be created in the world market in maybe in next 10 years time so high time we devise a strategy how do we capitalize on this available opportunity the available headroom for growth is the fundamental thing which we have to think today the questions that i am going to ask 
my panelists, and all of us are going to engage in that, is basically, these are all theoretical qualitative questions, but at the end of the day, if you think seriously, you will find out a way that how can you be the lead actor in capitalizing on this revenue, available head, headroom for growth, and so on. This is going to be the key fundamental uh, growth point that is there in my mind, and keeping that in mind, we will engage in the dialogues. That is the fundamental thing. Now, having said that, let me begin with uh, Swaroop, my dear friend Swaroop. Swaroop is very, very well-known personality in film industry. He has done a lot of work in licensing, distribution, production, were having worked with a couple of the largest organizations on this planet Earth. So you have Disney, Star, you have Sony, all of them are big organizations. I'm going to ask you, uh, Sarubji, so when you look at the independent producers, see, commercial producers are a happy segment. Uh, we don't have to talk about them. But I'm talking about independent producers, creative people uh, sitting here in this hall. What are all the key messaging you would like to give when they cross the border, when they cross the border and try to monetize their films? Good afternoon, Film Bazaar. A um, couple of years ago, I was sitting at the last chair in one of these rooms, and <clears throat> I come from a traditional studio background. I'm a film student. I worked at Disney Star when it was Star, and then I moved to Sony to launch their movie channel called Sony Pix, which I launched in India as the content head, and was also involved for the launch of Gold, Star Gold in India, way back in 2001. I was about 21, 22 years old. And then I went to study. It didn't help. I went to one of the finest universities, blew up all the money, came back, got myself a job, very boring job. <clears throat> but then I made it interesting because I moved to the film space from general entertainment because that was where I wanted to be. And <clears throat> I used to look after acquisition of content, which is sitting on the other side of the fence and evaluating what kind of films, what kind of shows are we going to buy for my channel, which was a new channel, and will we also invest in new talent? Now, there was something that we did way back in 2012. I'm going a little in history because you must know that times have changed, and in 2012, uh, we partnered with Whistling Woods. I met some students, some great students from Whistling Woods yesterday, and we conceptualized a show, which was The Hunt for a Filmmaker, called Gateway, the Bible for which was written by us at Sony. It was Project Greenlight meets The Apprentice. And Project Greenlight was made famous by Matt Damon. And we had Ashok Amritraj, Anurag Basu, and a host of other great filmmakers come in as mentors. And it was a 13 episode. And it finally gave us two great names from that show. One is Bijoy Nambiar, who directed Shaitan who's doing a couple of good films, and Lijo Joe's Pelliseri, who's now a very famous Malayalam director uh, and a friend. What we learned in that process is uh, what are the challenges that you know, a first-time director or a first-time producer faces, and we gave them the opportunity that if you finish all the 13 tasks which are for a filmmaker or a producer, you get to do a film with Sony Pictures in Hollywood as a chief AD to a director, which was produced by Hyde Park. Now, Bijoy won it, Lijo was second. So I kind of thought that, OK, I'm stuck in a corporate job. I need to do something very different. And in 2014, I was going to the other side of the fence, which is help people navigate their films for licensing. Now, the traditional licensing business in India was very archaic and old school, that any Bollywood producer would just want to hive off his film after theatrical and recoup as, as much as 70 to 80% of his investment from traditional television. There was no OTT way back in at least till 2012, 13, 14, and Sony Live had just been launched. So when this happened, they were not willing to dissect, slice and dice rights 
and also territories, which are very crucial for a film. Uh, people were not treating their movies as an IP. It is something that you create and that stays with you for 60 years as a legacy. And that's how big studios function. That's how producers function. That's what gives them the ROI. Their families inherit large libraries. They make money over it. You look at the Mehra, Prakash Mehra family. You look at Yashraj, Dharma. All of them have built a library, which is an IP, which is a legacy. Unfortunately, I started off as an independent producer myself. And I lost a lot of money. And finally, I decided there's something that I'm not doing correct. What I was not doing correct was I was meeting wrong people. People who were discouraging me that, you know, there's no room for independent films. There are no buyers. There are no sellers. You know, sales agents will rip you apart. And, you know, they were giving me darkness, selling me darkness. So I went down, took out the rights management system of what studios operate on. And in my session yesterday with the students of Satyajit Ray Institute and Whistling Woods and the producer's workshop that I did yesterday, I kind of briefly navigated them how much money can you make or how is the way that you can really, really look at syndicating your film and not taking a no for an answer. And as luck would have it, there are about 30 plus rights that a content creator creates after he makes an audiovisual medium divided it or multiply it into three times into the number of languages, the number of subtitles that you create, the versions that you create, becomes an IP. So in terms of an independent film producer's journey, everybody wants a great deal from an OTT platform, mostly, you know, MG-based deals. Not everybody gets it. Some lucky ones get it, who've done the festival rounds, you know, and there's always this olive wreath syndrome that films follow. But some movies get, you know, noticed by certain sales agents, by certain platforms, and they are the lucky ones. Now, I work with the not so lucky ones mainly, and what they should know is that you necessarily don't need an MG deal to cut out your expenses. There are enough ways and means to, you know, cartelize and slice and dice your rights and make money over a certain period of time. So there's no darkness, it just takes time. And yes, um, I did move eventually to doing commercial films and I'm doing two as we speak and I'm sorry, I was not prepared. I had to kind of write notes like you do in school and come prepared for this August gathering. But uh, what's most important for an independent filmmaker is that you must put yourself in the shoe of a platform where you want to pitch your film and see are you hitting the check boxes? Is it engaging? Is it something that they'll be proud to have? Is it something which will give you a return after the first cycle of rights are sold? What kind of licensing are you looking at? You know, does that film have a certain, you know, stickiness that people will come and watch it again? There are lots of muddling that you need to do and also look at your costs, you know, the cost of money, the interest, how much money you're going to make. Are you going to burn a hole in your pocket? Are you going to wait for profits to come in your next cycle? So it's a very vicious cycle, but um, no, it's not dark. I mean, independent filmmakers also make money. Uh, luckily, this country had some great platforms like UTV World Movies and, you know, NDTV Lumia, which are no longer there, but they were replaced by now the OTT platforms. But it's becoming increasingly difficult because the selection criteria is very subscription driven. You know, you're, you, it needs to hit the right boxes. Now, I have a list of, you know, checklists that one should keep in mind because this is with my interaction with basic platforms. It, it's, it's got a lot of, you know, filters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's like a, you know, a dhobi list that what are the things that you should have in your film that can qualify for an MG deal. Otherwise, the traditional, you know, revenue share or a hybrid model where they pay you a certain money and they ask you to, you know, share rights and share revenues for a certain period of time. So the challenge is that you need to really have patience to keep your film and not, not succumb to any kind of blackmail to parting your rights at a very, very, you know, nominal or a peanut price. You need to hold your ground. That's very important. Thanks, Arup. My, my next question is with Ms. Nasreen, traveled from UK to share uh, her thoughts with all of you. Morning when I was talking to her, 
she was very excited to interact with innovators. She said, I have come to meet with innovators. So uh, the obvious question to her is, what filters do you apply, assuming our independent producers, they go with the films, they approach C4, BBC in the UK, or many other uh, available opportunities. So what filters you apply, I mean, what is the selection criteria you normally put to evaluate the films, the variety of content uh, that we talk about? Okay. Uh, is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Basically, I've been doing this work since 1982, which is really 40 years. And the first thing I would like to say, briefly, is that the audience has totally changed. Obviously, we are talking about 40 years, which is two generations of audience. So what was possible in the 80s is no longer possible today. One simple thing is that Channel 4 was the fourth channel in England, and everybody got very, very excited because it was the new channel on the block. But since 1982, there are 800 channels. So for Channel 4, they were very lucky, like BBC. They had a profile and a long-term relationship with the audience. BBC functions on drama, and news, and thankfully the streamers are not interested in creating news programs. Once they do that, then the broadcasters may have to rethink again. But however, the audience numbers has really dropped. Not just because of the streamers, it's because of the 800 channels in the UK. And in terms of the Indian films, in the 80s, early 80s, there was no YouTube. So when you showed an Indian film, everyone was very, very happy. The Asian audience was very happy. I have to say, the first Indian film that we showed in 1982 was Shole. And Channel 4, in those days, their top rating was 4 million, and Shole got 1 million, which is huge for 1982. It's an Asian audience, there are two and a half million people from South Asia, and that means a million people watch Shole. Why? Because they couldn't see it anywhere else. Now they can see everything everywhere. So that's a big thing. So what do I do when I select today? What I did then, and Channel 4 wanted, were movie stars. Today we cannot afford to buy films with movie stars because Netflix or Amazon or any of the streamers are offering, they are going after the stars. So if you have a Shah Rukh film or you have an Akshay Kumar film, the prices they offer, Channel 4 cannot compete. So thankfully, for many people in the room here, they are in more interested now in independence and regional cinema. So last year we had films from Assam, we had films from, I wouldn't say it's a small cinema, but Tamil films, because basically it's the Hindi film that gets distributed the widest, whether we like it or not. It has a great dominance all around the world. So what do I look for now? When Girishji asked me this question, I was not sure whether I could be a little technical about it, and he said, yes, be technical. What do I do? When I switch on a film, I want to be engaged with the story in seven minutes because I put myself in the place of an audience. If you are not caught into that drama or that story, within five to seven minutes, you have the option of changing channels. Whether it is web series, you skip it, or whether you don't. People are not patient. Sometimes I find that the Indian film pace is very slow, and Indian life is not at all slow. So I don't understand this complete split. The stories are very long in telling us. We'll have a shot, the first shot of a film, you'll see a long road, and there's a man on a, on a motorbike, and he's coming towards you slowly, not even speeding past. This is not Top Gun. This is a slow gun, and he's coming slowly from the distance. Now you tell me how many people are going to stick with him. They're not. So really, my feeling is, Five minutes, your first five minutes, seven minutes. Be humble and say, why should anybody watch my movie? What are you doing to make it interesting? The first five minutes, the second thing is casting. You don't have to have stars. 
nobody in the West knows these stars' names. They, I remember there was a tribute to Mr. Bachchan, and one of the places had the poster, and they even spelled Bachchan's name wrong. So it doesn't really matter to the West. What they want is a good story, good acting. Web series has really increased the talent pool, and everybody should be very proud of this. There are people from all around India who know how to act. Stars don't act, stars are personas. You go to see Shah Rukh, you go to see Amir, because it's Amir. You don't go for a character, whereas the independents, they're characters, and people identify with characters. Then, the length of the film. Believe me, I know some independent filmmakers who will make a two and a half hour film, which should be 90 minutes or 100 minutes, and will not sit and watch another two and a half hour film. Now, how many of you have watched two and a half hour films, very slow films, and said, fantastic? You don't watch, so please think about the length. If you read some Japanese poetry, haiku poetry, and a ghazal. Look at a ghazal. Ghazal sells the whole story in two lines. Now, if he went on and on and on about the dawa and the splitting the dawa and how much is the dosage of the dawa, you would also lose interest in ghalib. So please think, be brief. If you've got something to say, say it quickly. And on that note, I should pass the mic back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Nasreen. I'm going to I'm uh, I'm going to ask two very quick questions. I'm going to push you further on that C4 contributions uh, with the Indian cinema. Uh, the first thing I guess in 1982 C4 started, and you straight away engaged with us. And today is 2022, so 22 plus 18. If my maths is right, it's almost 40 years, four decades. So how do you see this journey happening? And uh, from 1982, you engaged, you provided a platform for Indian producers, and today, 2022. So how this shift has happened of the growth and culture? Well, financially, you all know that uh, a certain, I mean, the streamers have allowed the talent pool, more voices, directors, writers, actors to come in. So you've got a very vibrant, vibrant possibility of new storytelling. But however, uh, don't, the question is the formula. Indian cinema's formula is what people uh, love, but you must have to break the formula. You must break formula. If you always have a village, and the, in the village there's one fight going on, it becomes a formula, like the Hindi cinema is formulaic, what they call. People in the West are not at all adverse to songs. They love songs. Now, Stefan will tell you when he distributed Hindi films, I have to make one point, is that this terrible word, Bollywood, horrible word, has become the password. <laughs> you meet anybody in, in the West and they'll say Indian cinema, you, they'll say, ah, Bollywood. But it doesn't mean they've seen anything. So what has happened is that the expectations of Bollywood has slightly ruined the, the atmosphere. However, people like what is unique to Indian cinema. There is no point in making a film which Hollywood does better. But it's the Indian storytelling, the songs, the drama, the emotion, people like them. Really, they really like them. In terms of the independent, they look for very real stories. Now, we, all of you probably weren't born then at all, but think of Mr. Ray. Even today, Satyajit Ray's name is huge in the West. If you ask people who are cinema goers, which Indian film, they will talk about Satyajit Ray. Why? Because he tells a universal story about something specific. So it's a family in a village and the two children, the, the brother and the sister. There's a terrible storm, the girl gets a fever and she dies, and the parents are distraught. They cannot bear to live in that village anymore, so they move to the city, and that's Pathar Panchali. If you can tell your story in two sentences, then you've got a story. So I keep saying, 
Think about what you're really saying. What is your film saying? And it doesn't have to be, you know, I think it's, again, one more little thing is subtitles. Be very careful about your subtitles when you are exporting films, because I always say that uh, bad subtitles can ruin a good film, but good subtitles will not save a bad film. So be very careful about these subtitles. Now my next question is with uh, Stephen. Uh, he's come from uh, Germany. And uh, what I want to go is, uh, what I'm going to ask you is, you have been in Film Bazaar, you have seen many films. You have been at various parts of the country, you have interacted with many producers. Again, you have seen a lot of films. So uh, straight away, the question is, uh, you have seen the Indian films, the productions that has happened here. Assuming we dub it in German language and take it in Germany, so how, how do you think this is going to fly with them or what kind of trade you are expecting cross-border? Before answering your question, I actually would like to respond to what Nasrin said about this, the, the, the stories and the stars and all that. It was kind of uh, exciting for me. The, where I come from, I, I started as a distributor in Germany, introducing, let's say, Japanese or Korean films in Germany. So for me, this, the directors and filmmakers were the stars of the film. Like that's my, what that was my belief. And then suddenly, uh, we were in the middle of something. Like um, we released a film called Kabekushi Kabigam in, in Germany because we really loved the movie. That was 2002 or something, and uh, it's a Karan Johar film, so we really loved that movie. And but overnight, uh, Shah Rukh became a star. So we suddenly were in a situation where we are dealing with um, mainstream Hindi films and with with uh, sometimes also very beautiful films, uh, star, star driven, and. Um, that was at first a bit confusing uh, for, for us uh, to, 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 to get a better understanding of how things work. I agree with what you said, like people come to see a Shah Rukh and, and But I feel like being here today, I'm very excited after these few days in the film bazaar talking to projects, to filmmakers and to get the vibe here. And I really want to say, I'm so excited about what's coming out of this and I hope I can contribute something either as distributor or producer, co-producer, because that is the good news. It's that in case the star system is changing and uh, it's good news for the filmmakers, I think. And, and that is uh, something, I think these are very exciting times. There are many like uh, platforms, OTT and players which encourage like uh, original film making and stories. So I feel like very excited about this and uh, what's, what's happening here. Um, I want to add one more thing to what you said about the stories and uh, haikus and, and I also totally believe in this. Um, that is what makes film travel and live long. Uh, but I also feel we have something like writer's cinema. So lots, um, a lot of people think about cinema as, let's say, uh, it's something, the stories, which will, you know, um, spread out to an audience. I, I would like to add painter's cinema, you know. It is, sometimes it's the visuals. It is something like which is hard to talk about, actually. Where that's where language is ending somehow. And that's what gets me excited if I'm a distributor and I go to a festival, let's say, or I come here and see the, the book with the 200 films in the screening room, what do I do? Do I read all the synopsis? Maybe no. I, 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 I can be, get like, uh, but I, if there is an image catching the attention, and I cannot describe that, it's not systematically something, but I know that from colleagues from, who distributes films in all parts of the world, that these elements are very important. And uh, so I want to encourage you as filmmakers, producers, also to think of the painter's side of cinema and how to present your film, uh, um, thanks to you know visuals. And in a way, that is my belief that um, 
that cinema is a communal experience and then there are films you know uh, which go to festivals internationally because of there are let's say unicorns you know something rare something you cannot put into a category and um, that is what i'm want to be part of either as distributor or as a producer or co-producer and i have met some unicorns here and friends and uh, i think this is Sorry, now I get confused. I need your, your questions. <laughs> and um, the, do you said something about dubbing uh, uh, in Germany that was part of the mainstream success and reaching out of, you know, for, uh, for Hindi films being dubbed into German, except the songs. We made sure don't dub the songs. And, but that's how my mother, and my daughters, my wife, myself, you know, and German audiences engaged, you know, with, with Hindi films because there's something maybe universal, the, the family values sometimes, or it was not the exotic, I think. It was really something on a deeper level, emotional, what, uh, what connected. I think Shah Rukh said it when he was in Germany and being asked why he thinks that his films work so well there. He said, like, you know, in Germany, people have a, a button to push for, for, for everything. Like, it's very engineering and technically. And he thinks, like, his films and he, what he can do is, like, he's a button to push and then you get the emotion, like, to cry. You don't see people cry. And he really triggers uh, emotions. And on that level, I'm a little bit proud, you know, that we were in between or working hard for as many years that there is an emotional connect and then people will remember more than a brand or a star, I think. And, uh, and we always, as a distributor, uh, made sure that there are classic films or, uh, I don't know, or, or filmmakers by, like films made by Farah Khan yeah, or Mani Ratnam or Ashim Aluwalia, Kanu Bale. I mean, filmmakers who make really individual work to release these films and to showcase that. So I think, if you have, if you can choose and see the diversity, and that's here in Film Bazaar, I think that makes me and I think many others happy. Sorry for this long. Great, Stephen. One more related question, which you can very quickly answer, but it's going to be, it's, uh, it's going to facilitate the cross-border trade. Whenever content, any part of the world, it crosses the boundary, and it moves from India to Germany, India to UK, India to any other place, Korea. So the, the fundamental issue is movement of natural person. A lot of artists will start moving from one country to another country. My experience with IT is information technology sector when we were growing. So Germany was a great place. We, everybody wanted to invest there. They wanted to collaborate. So we spoke to your country and they created a 3,000 visa. They called it green visa. They said 3,000 visas are available. So if you can, maybe go, when you go back next to your country and speak to your policymakers, if they have something in mind, since you have observed that there is a great potential in India. So if those kind of visas are created, where at least 2, 3,000 people, artists can go, those numbers we can discuss government to government basis, I think that's going to really help. And I just want to know that, how do you take it? Can I comment on this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because what is behind that word? It's people, right? And behind, let's say, the, the term co-producing, it is filmmakers talking to each other from different countries. So that is, I tr strongly believe in co-producing, which is maybe a comparison to what you are what you're saying with the visas. So you meet people from other places and you make sure that the film and give all your best, including money and including uh, creative input and talks, that the film will work in both, you know, both countries and even more countries or maybe even around the world. And I think that is a very strong concept. And so it's about people, actually. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Now I'll move to uh, Mr. Pame. Uh, Sir, the feedback from the creative industry is feedback from the creative industry is in this hall, you talk to any independent producer who is pushing his films cross border in other countries. The fundamental problem is piracy. See what happens, supposing the film has gone to X country and it is pirated. 
that it had a huge impact on the revenues. It's affecting in India as well, domestic market, but outside. When the films are pirated there, if I am the producer, so I have to fight the case, I have to file a legal case in that country, right? Because it's not economic offense, it's like a personal basis you are going to file the case. And if the case duration is long, lawyers are very expensive. I have made one crore a film, I will end up spending five crores in fighting the case against piracy. So this is a growing concern where industry wants that government should help us. So uh, is there any, there are treaties, Bern Convention is there, WIPO Treaty is there, a lot of treaties we are covered with. But ultimately, the industry is suffering. So is there any way we, uh, government can intervene and at least either facilitate to expedite the cases? I'm sure you can't pay lawyer's fee. That's not going to happen. But there are frameworks, if they can be aggressive, is there any way government can help industry so that they feel very safe? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, well, I feel so humbled uh, to be here in the midst of people who are from the, this industry. Being here in this ICFI and Film Bazaar itself, uh, well, I feel not worthy at all to be here. I meet many people, they talk only about films. You know, for me, for the first 24 years of my life, I ended up studying to be where I am. The remaining 14 years, I've, I've been working in villages and small town where there's hardly electricity, internet connectivity, so uh, I had not gotten so much time to watch movies. Uh, well, I remember in one of the flights, I was sitting with Ajay Devgan on my side, and then I had nothing to talk because I had not watched any of his movies. So, well, uh, so that much of ignorance I am in the movie world. But now that I've joined this ministry and looks after the, uh, this sector, the question that you just asked is one of the concerns which my minister, Andurak Singh Thakur, and my secretary is so, so uh, committed on addressing it. So um, <clears throat> if this goes well, as a part of the amendment to the Cinematography Act of 1952, we are trying to put a clause whereby a person if one particular uh, website is hosting that pirated movies, you know, uh, we just give the power to the IT department to take down that particular website. So it is already there as a part of the draft amendments of the cabinet bill. And if this goes through, I think this will help uh, many of the film producers and directors like all of you. So we're trying our best on that side, from the ministry side. The second thing is, uh, well, I will, not I will not quote his name. I remember just uh, like a week before, I met someone very important. <coughs> and I told him that the next one week from now, I'll be in Goa for ICFI. And he told me one thing, Armstrong, you, just do one thing for these filmmakers and producers. My daughter stays in New Zealand, uh, in Geneva. The day the movie is released in India, she already gets a copy, or someone is already getting a copy and watching it. However, for Hollywood movies, if they do that, some American people will be tracing her, you know, the IP address where it is being downloaded. I don't know how true is that, but so he was saying, why don't you empower all the Indian embassy, wherever it is? You just don't need 180 countries. You just need to identify where lots of Indian populations are there, especially. So maybe 20, 30 countries, you empower the embassies to take care of this wherever the download is taking place. You just innovate some technological tools, which I feel is not very difficult given the facts that we Indians are good in the IT field, I'm sure we can come up with that and you know, track down that particular IP address where download is taking place. So we'll be happy <laughs> to take your suggestions 
if you can give that, but this is one easily doable thing, empowering the Indian embassies wherever they are in those identified countries to tackle these uh, issues. And this, we can put it up as one of the agendas of the ministries. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, another question which everybody wants to uh, listen in this hall, and since last three, four days, minister spoke something yesterday. Secretary was very passionate, and he was personally trying to innovate even on the stage. What can I, good work can I do to industry? Sir, 75th year Ajadi Amrit Mahotso. So, uh, is there any special effort that you have in my mind or already announced which you would like to educate audiences to promote this sector, the government's uh, efforts? Uh, there are three, four things which uh, the government is really trying to push hard. One is, the, yes, as a part of the 75 years of our independence, uh, we want to get the local stories being told through the medium of films. So the ministry has, if I'm not mistaken, the figure is about 35 crores. We, at, through NFDC, we have, uh, ex, um, you know, extended our, in, um, the, extended the applications platform, and we have received quite a lot of regional uh, filmmakers and producers who have come forward to claim this, and some of them are on the final stage of its production. And we plan to uh, make many more such effort as a part of our uh, as Akam, we call it in sword. So that's one part which the ministry is looking forward. The second part is uh, many of you are independent filmmakers. Uh, we have something called the co-production. If any of the foreign filmmakers wants to come and tie up with the filmmakers and producers like you, the ministry introduces these schemes at the Cannes Film Festival this year that we are willing to give you 30% or up to 2 crore Indian rupees, uh, 250,000 US dollars, for the expenditure incurred in India. So I went to TIFF this year in September, and I was trying to identify some of those filmmakers who would be interested in tying up with uh, filmmakers here in India. One question they ask is, how do we believe? How do we trust them that we will get back? You know, suppose we make an agreement that I'll bring out certain portion of this money, you bring out certain portion of this money. After I take out my share, how do I trust that you know, he or she, whom I sign an MOU, will bring out his portion of the money. So there is lots of, seems to be quite a lot of trust deficits from those foreign uh, filmmakers. So I would like to encourage you all to reach out to any of your colleagues, friends, who are in the similar field to avail these facilities. Um, as my secretary had also told in several of his sessions that we are, uh, trying to reinvent the film facilitation office, make things easier, script evaluation. We want to make sure that it takes less than one week. Once a script is evaluated, you send to the ministry to get the approval. And don't think that the ministry, the sarkari, as you say, you know, is full of rate tapism, delays. I mean, I would like to tell you that there are people not only me, but there are many more young people who doesn't go home before clearing up all the files in their inbox and in their tables. So we are dedicated to bringing change in the government. We make, want to make things fast. In fact, I used to tell my staff that, you know, I want to see tomorrow's work done yesterday. So we're here to make things easier for you. We encourage you to take and avail all of those facilities which the ministry has introduced. And uh, now that uh, several big peoples are here, I was just discussing uh, with Mani Ratnam sir in the morning as we were together in the panel for 75 Creative Minds. I was requesting him, sir, as a part of this co-production, I would like to see, the ministry would like to see Mani Ratnam sir 
co-producing one movie with James Cameron or Christopher Nolan, you know, make it a big budget. The ministry will try to pitch in equally huge amount. That would be a big way to kick off these incentive schemes. That's what we were just discussing. So if any one of you has the mind, challenges to take up all of this, the ministry looks forward to new ideas. That's what I can tell you. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. up to the moderator. The time is, I think, already over. Another one, two minutes to go, but I will take your question, please. The government of India dragged their feet, took very long to come up with OCI. But I find, which is called overseas citizen of India, but I find that we are treated as stepbrotherly uh, treatment that we get. So I'm asking the minister, I am a film producer, maybe I like to produce with Mr. Chaturvedi, and uh, you are not extending the same kind of courtesy, I, I mean in abstract, to me as to, because NRIs are contributing quite a lot. Cochin Airport is built by, with NRIs money. Whole Punjab's tractors and lands and houses are built with the money people abroad. So you should also um, give us the same kind of courtesy. Uh, so I'll just take her question. Uh, Ma'am, I would like to know which passport you're holding. So as far as I can remember, the uh, audiovisual treaties signed with various countries and the incentive schemes, we do not differentiate uh, between OCIs and other foreigners. So <clears throat> for your reference, you can directly go to NFDC website you click the FFO link, there will be two policies that comes up. One is for those countries, 15 countries which we have signed a co-production treaties. The other one is for foreign film shootings. So there, as much as I remember, uh, I'm also just five months old in the ministry, but I do not remember differentiating between the OCIs and foreign filmmakers. Uh, Ma'am, uh, we will definitely think, look into that. Uh, we'll be happy to consider uh, your application. Please feel free to email us. We'll yeah. definitely look into that. And I think that would be yeah. that way. You can discuss offline in detail. Uh, you can discuss offline. In it. I'm sure, friends, you'll have a lot of questions. Uh, time is over. And huh? yes. So I'm um, sorry I'm butting in. There was I saw some, so I saw some students from from Satyajit Ray Institute and Whistling Woods here. There was a question that you guys had yesterday, and because we were very short of time, I'll quickly address it. You guys, I, I had to mull over it. You asked me a question about how does an independent film travel and what's the sweet spot for it. So for those young filmmakers who are going to make the first film or are producing their films or have got it financed. Uh, the sweet spot for a typical indie film or an independent film, which is a festival-driven film, or and may not necessarily be a very big ticket production, uh, if you guys are not getting an SWOD MG deal from one of the mainline streamers, hold on. You can also move to the non-traditional VOD like the AWOD or the EST or the pay-per-view models as soon as you can. and. In case that doesn't happen, then there are about four licensing models that are available to specifically indie filmmakers. Uh, if you get an MG-based deal, which is a hybrid deal, so if I have to give you an example, um, streamers like Amazon Prime Video have something called the Prime Video Direct model, which is very transparent. You don't need a sales agent. You don't need a Swarup Chaturvedi. You don't need an aggregator. If they like your film, they publish your film and they sign a document with you where you know how much revenue are you getting per minute based on the stickiness of your content, which is very, very important for you to note. It depends on how good your film is. If that doesn't work, then probably an aggregation deal uh, will take you places or 
you start reaching out to non-traditional platforms like a DTH award business, which is probably a Tata Sky or a or a Geo, which has which is a telco-based company which also publish content. You necessarily no need to you don't have to wait for somebody to come and buy your film. Thanks, Arup. I think friends, you may have a lot of questions. I know. My personal suggestion is please write to NFDC or once we close this session on the side of the session you can discuss all of us are available extremely sorry for that time is over just to sum up i would like to thank all of my distinguished panel for sharing the views thanks audience you have been absolutely top class and uh, what i personally see that collaboration is going to be the mantra for the future and try to collaborate effectively whether within india or cross border and last point that I want to make is believe in technology. Technology is changing very fast. It will have impact on your delivery. It will have an impact on your production. Take extra classes. Go for tutorials online. Meet your seniors who are techie and learn that. If you don't believe in technology, you are going to be left behind. With that, I would like to close the question, uh, this session. And uh, please write to us in case you have any further thoughts, write to NFDC. We will help NFDC to answer. Thank you.